Okay, it is 11 o'clock. We're going to get started here for our Tuesdays with Mackinac event. Um, I want to welcome everyone that has joined us here for another great policy uh, topic that we're going to be discussing for the next hour. Um, and just an introduction for those that are uh, new to the Mackinac Center or might not know much about the Mackinac Center. Uh, the Mackinac Center for Public Policy is a uh, Michigan-based, nonpartisan, uh, research firm and educational institute that advances public policies based on the principles of free market, limited government, personal responsibility, and respect for private property. Uh, founded in 1987, the center's core work is to research and develop free market solutions to current policy challenges. We also litigate in the public interest, advance government transparency, and educate citizens, media, and lawmakers on the benefits of free market approaches. Just a few logis logistical details before we introduce you to our speakers. Just a reminder, um, we'll be doing it throughout the event, but to keep your audio on mute, particularly if you exit and enter the, the uh, event. Um, you may submit questions throughout the event that we'll be trying to get to all of them by the end of the event, and we'll address them to each of our respective speakers. You may submit those via the chat box that you'll see on the right-hand corner. And we ask that if you are planning on um, if you are planning on submitting questions, that you edit your name to reflect your first and last name, so we can properly address you. Um, Want to get started with our president, Joe Lehman. Uh, before we we address the topic at hand, uh, Joe has some opening remarks that he'd like to deliver to our audience. Joe, thanks a lot, Don, and uh, thank you. Uh, all you Mackinac Center supporters who could join us today and, uh, and people interested in education. Uh, it's been uh, great to know that we have uh, your backing as uh, some things for the very first time uh, in, in most of our lives. And I want to let you know uh, today that uh, the Mackinac Center is healthy and strong. Our staff, uh, almost uh, 40 of us are uh, no one has been uh, physically affected by the virus uh, that, that we know of. Uh, and uh, actually, as far as I know, nobody in the Mackinac Center family, uh, any donors or uh, board members or anything like that, so we're grateful for it. And as an institution, we're strong. We into uh, the pandemic and subsequent lockdown with very strong financial reserves. We did that just as a matter of prudence over the over the years we built them because we knew that one day something would happen and this is what it turned out to be. So uh, we are able to focus on our priorities and get it. Our gift volume has uh, remained uh, good, uh, so much so that uh, uh, we was not a very hard call for us to say we're going to stick to our limited government principles and the Mackinac Center, which which stands for limited government, will not be taking uh, federal funds uh, to other organizations. So we've been able to pivot a lot of our normal policy agenda uh, to focus on the pandemic itself, lockdown. First 72 hours in Michigan, I would say uh, Governor Whitmer uh, had a pretty good run for 72 hours. She actually uh, adopted uh, several of our ideas, like making it easier to practice medicine across things like uh, eliminating artificial caps on hospital beds. Uh, but now the focus, uh, uh, more than anything, is how do we reopen society? And that's where uh, Governor Whitmer and the Mackinac Center have company on a number of things. So the Mackinac Center's goals regarding reopening society itself, which includes the economy, are number one, to make it safe for people to talk about reopening society without uh, being uh, immediately accused of having bad motives uh, or not caring about people. Uh, we also are shifting the focus of what sorts of enterprises should be allowed to operate right now. The governor's approach has been to divide them into essential versus non-essential. 
but we think that's um, not the best way. We think it's better to look at what can we do safely versus what cannot be done safely. And we think a great many uh, businesses that are now locked down by her order can in fact be done safely. And we think it is imperative to let the people at large make these decisions, um, have government uh, deciding for the people uh, things that, that they're able to do themselves. Uh, people have different appetites for risk. When it comes to risk, we think uh, the people uh, are, for the most part, in the best position to decide uh, instead of letting other people decide for us. So that brings us to education. Education, I've uh, always said at, at the Mackinac Center, is important uh, as a policy matter to, uh, to us because if we don't get education right, it might not matter what else we do get right. Education is utterly fundamental to, to our future. And if this pandemic is showing us anything, it's the value of choices and nimbleness in an education system and uh, an education ecosystem, really. And we know that we have to be on guard, that no one uses this crisis to lock in um, old bad ways of doing things or to further entrench certain special interests in labor unions. We saw in the governor's executive orders on labor unions, she written special exceptions uh, uh, for them, uh, right, right in the order that shows the powerful place that closer unionism sadly still has. So uh, we favor uh, more parental options uh, with support from the state instead of uh, the other way around, which is state option with support from the parents. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Don right now uh, so that he can speakers. But thank you again for your interest in the Mackinac Center and supporting us. And um, Don. Thank you so much for those uh, comments, Joe. Uh, very reassuring and um, obviously great to hear that we at the Mackinac Center continue on our, our path um, towards our vision. Um, Topic we're going to discuss today is education policy, and the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has rad radically changed for many families and children uh, what the familiar day-to-day -day world of American education looks like. Um, some of the questions that we're going to be discussing are these changes temporary? Are they long-lasting? Um, what can we learn from these changes? And what we can expect the education system to look like after this uh, moment fades, uh, with many parents in Michigan and nationwide now better able to watch their children's education experience up close and personal, how will this landscape, how will this change the landscape of school choice, both in Michigan and around the country? Um, so these big questions will guide our conversation uh, with our expert guests that we brought to you um, for our virtual policy forum on education. And uh, among, the, among the topics addressed will be how schools are adapting to the new reality of distance learning and what policymakers can do to advance education freedom and quality um, in light of these unprecedented challenges. Um, my name is Don Orico. I'm Director of Strategic Partnerships for the Mackinac Center. I am based here in sunny Land Lakes, Florida, um, a small piece of evidence of Mackinac Center's outreach throughout the country to advance our um, work and our agenda in every state of the country and to advance um, the successes that we've helped bring about in Michigan in every state of the country. Um, we have some great speakers for you. Um, first off, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Michael McShane. He's the Director of National Research at EdChoice, a leading national organization committed to promoting ideas and policies that advance educational freedom. Um, a former high school teacher with advanced degrees from Notre Dame and the University of Arkansas, his academic research, policy analysis, and commentary have been widely published on numerous topics related to education reform. Robert Pondicio is a senior fellow and vice president for external affairs at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, a national think tank that promotes educational excellence through research, analysis, and commentary. 
Mr. Pondicio is a former civics teacher as well and a former journalist. His columns frequently appear in major publications. And in 2019, his book about New York City's Success Academy Charter School Network called How the Other Half Learns won critical acclaim. And then finally, Ben DeGroo is the Mackinac Center's very own Director of Education Policy. He joined the center in 2015 after a long stint at Colorado's Independence Institute, where he provided expert analysis on school choice, school finance, collective bargaining, and education employment policies. Um, he has gradu graduated summa cum laude with a BA in history from Hillsdale College and went on to receive a master's degree in history from Penn State University. And um, I want to start with you, Ben, uh, with our first question. Um, we've seen, obviously, a vast majority of schools, if not all schools, have closed um, in the United States, including uh, here in Michigan, or there in Michigan, I should say. Uh, millions of school children uh, across the United States suddenly have been con confined to their homes um, to distance learning. Um, in Michigan, districts and charter schools have been rolling out distance learning plans on the fly, with today as the deadline to get them um, up and running. And many other states are facing similar challenges, uh, with some schools rising to the challenge, challenge but lingering obstacles remain, and um, many unknowns facing parents, educators, and children in the months ahead. So, Ben, since March 16th, K through 12 school buildings have been closed in Michigan and will remain closed through this academic year, something obviously that was not anticipated when the 2019-2020 school year started. And news reports have highlighted some of the significant challenges that this situation creates in different households. Not every family is the same, and not every family um, has the same conditions for children to learn in. So how prepared were we for something like this? And how would you characterize what you've seen as a response to this issue in Michigan, both by state education leaders and by local schools and educators? Thank you, Don. Um, I think uh, talking about how prepared Michigan was to address this is a great place to start the conversation. And if you focus on Michigan particularly, I would say the big lesson is what's been exposed uh, as in other places, is the, the ability of large top-down command and control education systems to adapt to a situation like this uh, has been uh, a struggle. And there's a weakness in the state's rigid top-down education infrastructure that we've seen. And uh, you know, for, for 10, 15 years or more, we've had leaders in this state uh, from all different uh, sectors who've called for reforms that, that could make the state more nimble, uh, more able to adapt and use technology. Uh, we know that online learning is not the ideal mode for every child, but there's a lot of tools in online learning and technology that school systems can, can use to mitigate the situation and make it better. And no, we weren't as prepared as we could be. Um, let's go back to March 20th. On that day, uh, about a week, um, after everything came down, the Michigan Department of Education put out a, a memo that, that caused a big stir in the world of education here locally. It really sent the wrong message. It basically said, um, your, edu your instruction that is going to go on, this distance learning, isn't going to count. And that discouraged and confused a lot of educators and really just, I think, highlighted and exposed this weakness. Um, th there's been a recent history of where the Michigan Department of Education has, has clashed with some uh, elements of innovative educators who are working around the state, um, trying to think of ways to measure and assess learning differently uh, and just be more creative in their approaches. And past years, uh, they spent more time uh, fighting with the Michigan Department of Education than uh, cooperating to help other educators in the state learn from them. And that's that's been a problem. So. I don't want to dwell too much on the, the past and the blame, so I'll kind of pivot to the positive stories. In the early days of the shutdown, we did see a lot of uh, really good responses. And I think this shows the other side of the coin, and that's uh, school systems that have already built a stronger uh, communication with and trust with their parents where they're serving were at an advantage. 
And um, in some cases, these are charter schools. In some cases, these are smaller districts. But you saw a lot of, a lot of heroic work from educators, um, di distributing food, distributing homework packets, um, distributing Chromebooks and devices to kids. Um, you know, where kids didn't, didn't want to learn before um, is a struggle. But where kids are engaged and want to learn, and the educators are dedicated, there's a lot of possibility. So fast forward to April 2nd, you have Governor Whitmer kind of uh, settles the landscape a little bit with their executive order and says we need to put out these distance learning plans in order to continue receiving funding. So that applies to every district and charter school in the state of Michigan. Uh, there's some advantages in that. It, it did recognize the need for more flexibility at the local level. Um, and it you know, faced the realities of the challenges that are there as far as some families and students not having the technology or the devices they need and, and figure out ways to address that. And what we're seeing is the local solutions um, are the ones that are, that are working the best. Again, that emphasis on flexibility. As we started to look through some of these, these plans, we call them uh, continuity of learning plans, I guess it's safe to say we've seen a mixed bag. Um, nobody's really going to penalize kids who don't you know, uh, finish all their assignments. That's kind of been the general state approach. But some other districts are figuring out there are ways to create positive incentives to help students learn. Uh, there are districts who are um, doing kind of the minimum or basic, and they're putting up links to th online resources like Khan Academy, uh, or they're just sending homework packets home to the parents and saying, hey, if you got any questions, call us. Um, but on the other end, we're seeing districts that are really kind of trying to put robust programs in place where teachers are interacting with students on a daily basis, or they're even doing uh, creative, uh, creative things like they're retraining their bus drivers to be mentors for students who are at risk. Interesting things like that. Uh, and some, some uh, uh, programs where school districts and businesses are cooperating to provide uh, electronic devices to, to low-income kids. We've seen that in Detroit and Grand Rapids. So I'll kind of leave it there for now. But I think this kind of what this leaves us is um, the potential danger is if there's a gap coming into this crisis between the advantage and the disadvantaged kids, uh, this crisis, if anything, is probably going to expose and, and widen that gap, and that's something to be concerned about. Key there, it sounds like, is adapting some of these, taking some of these changes that have been put into place and perhaps uh, making them uh, permanent. And as you said from the outset, being flexible um, with how education is delivered. And that flexibility allows for innovation and allows to adapt education into individual kids and not just a a one-size-fits-all approach, and it seems like that's been forced upon many of these school districts and states now, and uh, we're seeing some good things come out of that. Um, I want to turn to Mike McShane now. Mike, you've been um, writing about how different private schools around the country have responded um, to COVID-19, altering education, and how it's delivered uh, without in-person instruction. Can you share some of the highlights of what you've observed, what sort of themes you're seeing, and um, what lessons on the private side of education we could learn from this. Yeah, absolutely. So as the world sort of started to go to hell in a handbasket, what feels like two years ago, but was actually like six weeks ago, you know, mm -hmm. I was thinking to myself, you know, what, what can I do? What can I do to try and make this situation better? And it wasn't just, you know, keep talking about the same old things that I've talked about before, but how can we actually do something to help the millions of school children that are going to have their educations disrupted? And so I sort of took a look in the mirror and said, okay, well, I'm an education researcher. So how can I do research that can help this situation? And given the extensive contacts that I have in schools across the country, I said, look, why don't I try and reach out to schools that are figuring out ways to solve these problems and then share them with as many people as I possibly can? Um, and so that was the project that I set out to do. I interviewed and I'm continuing to interview um, really passionate, innovative school leaders across the country from a variety of different schools. So I've profiled schools and it's all available on Ed Choices blog, but I've interviewed schools from Nashua, New Hampshire to Copperfield, Texas to Phoenix, Arizona, um, urban schools, rural schools, um, Montessori school, a little bit of everything. And a few things have emerged that I think are, are sort of worth sharing as, as folks think about this. One, to kind of echo what Ben 
talked about is there's that old adage that the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago, but the second best time is today. Um, and I think what we saw in a lot of schools that had already laid down some of this infrastructure, so some schools that had gone to one-to-one -to -one devices or had created some kind of they, uh, some kind of distance learning, um, whether it was around snow days or that just had some of this communications infrastructure and technological infrastructure had a, a jump on everyone else getting involved in this. So in some ways it laid bare schools that hadn't necessarily been thinking in these ways, but it's also should be fair that there are lots of schools that are not necessarily, that are purposefully not technology forward. They are, they have the option to be sort of one to one student devices, but they choose not to because it's not part of their pedagogical model. And so it's sort of in some ways unfair to penalize them about it now because that wasn't what they were trying to do. The second thing, again, sort of to echo what Ben said, it seems like schools that are being successful with this are communicating, communicating, communicating. Um, so many of these schools from the outset even if they were communicating things that were not necessarily this is what our plan is or this is what's going to happen on Monday, it was, hey, we're monitoring this situation, here are the conversations that we're having, please share your thoughts, just keeping these lines of communication with parents open. And many of these schools, as they have transitioned to this, because it's new for everybody, for most schools that are out there, this is new, keeping those lines of communications open, frequently sending short surveys to families, asking what's working, asking what's not working, and being that kind of nimble and agile organization that can change based on, oh my goodness, we, we sent way too much this week. Kids were completely swamped by this. We need to, to move back. I think a third thing, there has been a lot of conversation about technology, technology gaps, the access to devices that students have, access to internet, act, uh, internet connectivity issues. Um, I want to highlight one particular school network, the um, Partnership Schools, which is a network of Catholic schools in New York City. Um, I have a great interview with Kathleen Porter McGee, who's the superintendent of those schools. And one of the things that she brought up was they serve generally a, a low-income population in what is, as, as best we understand, the sort of epicenter of the coronavirus in America, right? So they are, they got dealt a tough, uh, tough hand, um, and I think are playing it incredibly well. And one of the things that she said was, look, we need to get a hold of these families. She's like, I'm going to highlight four tools, right? Phone, email, Facebook, Instagram, right? Every one of her families had at least one, if not multiple, of those uh, of those methods to be able to get a hold of them. These kids did not fall off the face of the earth, and they were able to use these, I call them kind of high-tech, low-tech, right? So these are technology platforms, but that are free and ubiquitous. So hosting Facebook Live town halls to share information, having teachers set up Instagram accounts to create little bits of community. Um, I think we're getting really overwhelmed by this idea that, you know, every kid's going to have to have a computer and internet. It's not necessarily the case. A lot of these schools are being creative about the way that they use technology to communicate, to send things out to people. The last thing that I'll share that I think has been something that has, that is, I've been seeing across schools that's been useful is the difference between using synchronous learning, so the types of stuff that we're doing right now where everyone's in the same sort of shared virtual space, and asynchronous learning, which is using pre-recorded videos or worksheets that are sent and others. It strikes me that schools that are doing this well are using the synchronous time for community and the asynchronous stuff for content. So what I mean by that is many of you who've had elementary school students know that frequently schools start with kind of quote unquote circle time where kids get together and there's no real academic content happening, but kids are checking in with each other, teachers are making sure everything is, is where it's supposed to be. And in times like this that are very stressful and kids are scared and they're worried if their classmates are okay, creating just half an hour every day or every other day where they can check in with each other and make sure that everyone's doing okay, see their friends, um, has been super important. In high school times, a lot of high schools call this advisory time, but a lot of them are doing the same thing. So creating these regular times and not trying to have that bear the burden of actual content instruction, because I think all of us know 
putting, I'm a 35 year old man and the thought of sitting in front of Zoom conference calls all day is soul crushing. So imagine for like a 16 year old. But the idea of, look, we're gonna have these little check-ins maybe a couple times a week where we're gonna make sure everybody's okay. But then most of the actual academic content can be done asynchronously. Watch these videos, do these worksheets, check in with us over time. Um, so that's, I mean, I've learned a lot from these other people, but I think as schools in Michigan and around the country are thinking about these distance learning plans, as other schools are pivoting, I hope they can look to that series that I did, see some of these lessons that have been learned, frankly, mistakes that were made that were then fixed afterwards and can be better at what they're doing. Great, Mike. Thank you for uh, sharing. And where can we find that research, that series that you did in the research? Where would we be able to find? Where would our audience be able to find that? Yeah, if you head to Ed Choices, uh, www.edchoice.org. I think our our blog just got rebranded, so it's something like Ed Choice Engage or something. But if you just go to Ed Choices website, www.edchoice.org, you should be able to find it. Great. Thank Thank you, Mike. I want to turn uh, to Robert Pondicio for our next question. Uh, Robert, you, you authored a book, an aforementioned book, on uh, the Success Academy Charter Network in, in New York City, and then um, followed it up with some observations on how they adapted to distance learning during this uh, virus. Um, despite what that looks like and what sort, of lesson, what sort of lessons can we take away from that about how to best equip schools to succeed in any type of crisis situation? Um, especially schools that are serving large numbers of uh, low-income kids? Yeah, that, that's a, a, an interesting question and a two-part question, really, because on the one hand, Success Academy has adapted uh, extraordinarily well. I mean, they were very early out of the box uh, with remote learning plans. If I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, they even closed their schools a few days more New York City schools in which most of them are, are, are co-located. Uh, announced a system-wide shutdown. So, um, you know, as ever, Eva Moskowitz, the, the CEO of Success Academy, is is not uh, prone to admiring problems for very long. She's her 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 default mode is is to act, and in this case, uh, she and Success Academy have acted quickly and well. Uh, so you see a lot of very good things happening there. Um, they are doing both synchronous and asynchronous learning. Uh, they are doing a lot of uh, large group instruction. Uh, they have, have not skimped at all, to, as far as I can tell, on giving feedback uh, to kids, uh, calling children, ele elementary school children, twice a day, uh, each teacher to check in. So they have been uh, aggressive. Uh, and if you know anything about Success Academy, this is not surprising. This is just kind of stamped on, on, on their DNA. Uh, so that, that's all to the good. The, the, there's, you, know, you can tell there's a but coming, and here it is. Um, I'm just not sure it makes sense to hold them up as as the exemplar of what other schools should be doing. Um, you know, I, I take Mike McShane's point very well about um, you know the, the, that cliche about how the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago, the second best time is today. Well, I'm not sure that today is the best time to try to recapture the preparation work we should have done in terms of technology and and devices uh, and whatnot. Um, in other words, we are, and we can talk about this at length uh, later on, uh, but you know, we're, we're gonna be facing a foreseeable crisis in the next couple of months in terms of massive learning loss. And the, the point making about Success Academy is, look, this is, this is an organization that's absolutely at the top of their game, uh, and, and it's a school of choice. So you know, the, the book that you nicely alluded to that I wrote you know, makes this clear at length about how you know, a lot of what they do is enabled by an extraordinary level of parental and, and prodigious demands that are made of, of, of parents. So in other words, this, this uh, well was well primed uh, to, to, to see the results and the response that they've had. The vast majority of other uh, schools, public and private, are not success academies. So I'm not sure I would use them as the example of what ought to be done, rather the aspiration of what could be done if we get these conditions uh, right in advance. Uh, but we're not going to recapture or build those conditions now under COVID conditions. So this is a good good thing to learn from going forward, but I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense to expect schools to try to do this on the fly right now. This is, this is what I referred to in a piece I just wrote as shoe bomber planning. In other words, planning for the last attack as opposed to planning to thwart the next one. The next one is foreseeable. Uh, if we get back into regular brick and mortar schools by September, 
uh, we're going to be facing prodigious learning loss. So I think smart uh, uh, superintendents and CMOs are, are already asking the question, okay, what are the conditions we'll be facing come September? How do we prepare for that? But, uh, the low income students that um, are obviously most adversely affected by this. Um, what are your thoughts on, on how we can better prepare them, both in your experience with uh, the Charter Academy Network in New York, but around the country? Um, how do we uh, better prepare them for uh, not facing a crisis like this and being um, caught flat footed, I guess, again? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, again, I think the, the, one of those horses has already left the barn, right? So let's let's be candid about that. This is why I'm encouraging folks to think about the conditions we will face as opposed to what we should have been fixing a few, a few months ago. Uh, look, you know, this is my orientation. I was a, a fifth grade teacher for many years at a low performing school in the South Bronx in New York City. Uh, that's that's why I'm harping on on the foreseeable um, problems that we're going to be facing. Ben was saying earlier about how uh, the COVID crisis has exposed many of these gaps. Well, they've actually exacerbated them, right? In other words, um, kids who have uh, in, engaged parents who have devices and bandwidth who are motivated, et cetera, or can be made motivated by their parents are not gonna suffer nearly as much learning loss as, as low income kids, for example, who don't have those advantages. So those gaps will foreseeably widen. Um, look, you know, this is where I, I don't want to uh, pretend that there's a, a right answer here. I think local conditions have to be weighed. Um, but if I'm a district superintendent right now, I'm thinking about things like, okay, who can teach anybody in the district, you know, uh, starting in September? Uh, what can I do in terms of uh, ability grouping, in terms of small group instruction, uh, in terms of, frankly, this, this rubs folks uh, like us the wrong way, uh, centralized planning, because I want I want teachers to be focused on remediating foreseeable gaps right now. I don't want them spending their time planning lessons. I want to see them uh, working with kids, being diagnostician, assessing, etc. Real nuts and bolts stuff to try to make up as quickly as possible for that lost learning time. This is not going to be a a um, forever condition. I think if we approach this as a foreseeable two to three month intense intervention to bring those most disadvantaged back up to where they might have been had we not had this disruption, uh, then we're gonna be better off. Thank you for that, Robert. Uh, really great, really great um, answers there. I wanna turn back to Ben. Ben, um, we're just starting to turn into a, another aspect of this crisis. We're just starting to come to terms with the impending fiscal cliff um, that many state and local um, school districts will be now uh, faced with. Uh, real widespread budget cuts are going to hit schools hard, um, as they haven't done in years. And state lawmakers are going to face some tough decisions, especially given what Robert talked about in terms of that loss of learning time that we, we're experiencing right now. Um, putting this situation in perspective, what should policymakers be uh, looking at to make these tough fiscal decisions? Yeah, summarize well, bigger challenges are looming, uh, fewer resources are gonna be available, so the answer is uh, we can't do business as usual. Uh, to put this in perspective, on, on March 11th, the Mackinac Center published an article I wrote uh, titled, Michigan for People Funding Reaches an All-Time High. Do you all remember that was the same day that COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic? And so right there is your peak of the cliff. Uh, we, we just had gotten that 2019 data from the state and highlighted the fact that Michigan was approaching $15,000 per student and per people revenue and uh, not, getting, not getting very good results for it. And uh, little did we know what was coming next. And that is, here we are a month later, um, two of the biggest sources of revenue that affect Michigan schools, and I think a lot of states that depend heavily on state revenue, this is a big deal. Uh, sales and income tax make up about $9 billion of K-12 education revenue in the state of Michigan, which is almost almost half the dollars that come in. And those have taken a hit in the last couple of months. Um, we're, we're just coming now to the point where we're starting to get projections of where this is gonna come down and uh, you know, money's coming in to tide things over for this year. For local leaders in the short term, 
um, these distance learning plans have set in stone that they have to keep all their staff in place. And, you know, well, with fairly good reason to providing some kind of employee, employment stability, that's fine. But on average, 80% of a school district's budget is tied to their staffing. So as they're trying to adapt to the distance learning situation, there, there's a little room to maneuver, but not a lot. And we don't hear a lot of discussion about what happens to things like the money they spend on uh, bus fuel or utilities or substitute teachers, the things that you don't need as much of during a, a, a global pandemic situation. So there are there is room for uh, many districts to maneuver in the short term, right? Uh, and there's there's really no telling what Lansing lawmakers are going to do for the next few school aid payments, uh, as we're kind of waiting on those revenue projections to come in in the state uh, in in the month of May. Uh, but my advice for state lawmakers is, let's not do the instant gut reaction thing, which is ah these revenue projections come in, let's just you know, make these cuts across the board. Let's stop and step back a bit and think about uh, creative strategic ways. Maybe the way we've been funding education in the past is not the most effective. Uh, and one example that stands out that I've recommended relates to intermediate school districts. Michigan has 56 of these agencies. Um, a lot of states don't have them. They're, they're bureaucratic. Uh, they're generally charged with um, administering and overseeing uh, the delivery of special education services. They also provide back office support for districts and things like that. What people don't realize is a couple of things. ISDs are generally more protected from this economic downturn. They depend on local property tax. They have access to, to much more of that than the average school district and much more than the average charter school, which has no access to property taxes. And they've been relatively well off. So since 2004, uh, while public school enrollment has dropped in our state by 14%, Michigan is a declining enrollment state, uh, real, real ISD spending adjusted for inflation has grown by about one third. So more and more of the dollars in K-12 education are being funneled through these agencies. Now is the time to think about, can we redirect some of those dollars that are going to ISDs and send them closer uh, where the decisions are being made to affect students to support a nimble, more flexible uh, local strategy. So bigger challenge is gonna come in the year ahead, fiscal year 21. We don't know what that means, but the time is to start thinking now about uh, creative ways to cut the excess and the fat out of the education, state education budget and focus as much as possible on dollars that follow students uh, to places where they're chosen. And I would also add another area that I hope our, our lawmakers have the courage to look at is to give cover to local districts as they negotiate collective bargaining agreements and provide extra flexibility there. Because again, 80% of those budgets they're operating are tied up in staffing decisions and they're gonna need more flexibility to uh, address these significant challenges with more flexibility. Uh, quickly, Ben, you mentioned um, obviously the, the budget shortfalls. Uh, what, if any, federal money is coming um, back to the states via the, the CARES Act? Right, so uh, I'll very quickly go through this. There are three main buckets of money that you may have heard of the CARES Act that passed about a month ago. Um, and I'll list them in order of largest to smallest, or I guess most conventional to most innovative, both would apply. First is this uh, emergency relief fund, which is about $13.5 billion with a B, and that, leaves about $390 million for Michigan. 90% uh, of that has to, has to pass straight through the Department of Education to local districts and charter schools and uses a Title I formula and uh, that is very extremely complicated and very few people on the planet understand. But the net result of it looks like uh, Detroit Public Schools is gonna get a huge, huge chunk of that money and for example, uh, compared to Detroit charter schools, which serve a very similar population, population of students, is gonna get significantly less. We're still trying to nail out the numbers on. That. That's something to watch there. The second pot of money are these called the governor's fund. And instead of running through the State Department of Education, governor fills out an application. Um, and this money can be split between K-12 and higher ed. There's about $89 million available to Michigan uh, we've advocated one of the uses for this should be things that directly support students with learning loss, and that would be reading scholarships. 
like Florida has done, which would be a fund that they could use to buy tutoring services or software curriculum, um, things like that to help them catch up when they're behind on reading. Huge. The third pot of money is this one that just came out yesterday, and it's for uh, districts with the high or states with the highest coronavirus burden. And it's a small pot of money and about $180 million nationally. But it's money that, if we're creative in Michigan, could be used for things like uh, direct grants to families, uh, could be used for things like expanding online course access for students across the state. I'll finally add, it's not in the CARES Act, but one thing that we advocate for the Mackinac Center is if there's any future federal action, it shouldn't be in the form of uh, bailouts per se, but it should be in the form of unlocking uh, innovation and parent choice and freedom. And that is, we've come out and joined a coalition that would say uh, those 529 savings accounts that you can use for college and, and K-12 tuition, we should make those available for parents who have at-home learning expenses. That's one thing that the federal uh, government could do. Uh, or maybe even something like a, a, a tax credit system that, that would provide tax credits for donations to uh, private school scholarships or uh, devices, internet access for kids in, in low-income situations. So that's what the federal situation looks like. Thank you, Ben. Um, I want to turn back to, to Mike. Uh, Mike, obviously these difficult economic times are going to impact private schools as well. Uh, particularly families that um, already were living on tight budgets trying to send their children to private schools. And um, we know not long before this crisis hit that um, many private schools around the country were um, excitedly anticipating the results of a big Supreme Court decision um, called Espinoza, the Espinoza case, that would um, really open up the landscape for private school choice programs around the country. So how concerned um, should we be about the impact on private school options for families in different states? And um, how do you see this affecting the landscape for private school choice going forward? I mean, I think we should be very concerned for private schools. I don't want to, after the rosy picture Ben just painted, I don't want to have to uh, continue depressing all of you or if they... You know, I'm, I'm calling from the Central Times, so it would be even less appropriate to start day drinking at this point. But to continue to paint the, uh, the portrait of the gathering clouds, I mean, uh, private schools, if we look back to the Great Recession, the last kind of major economic shock to hit both household budgets as well as state and local budgets, the best research that we have, a couple of uh, researchers at Harvard crunched the numbers and estimated that the Great Recession culled about a third of private schools in America. So about a third of private schools in America were, were closed um, as a result of the Great Recession. And the Great Recession was a slower burn than what we're having right now. This took place over the course of a couple years. Um, so it is not unreasonable for us to expect a substantial percentage of students to not be able to attend private schools in the fall based on the financial situation of their families. Now, on one end, we can look at the impact that that will have on private schools, which will be serious and negative. And most of the private school leaders that I speak to are very, very concerned about this. Even what we would consider to be strong, fiscally sound private schools. They do not operate on big margins. They rarely charge a tuition level that's the actual cost to educate. They rely on a lot of private philanthropy, so you have the double whammy there uh, where if people have fewer philanthropic dollars to give. But we also need to think about the vicious cycle here on public schools as well. Um, my colleague Robert Enlow, also on the EdChoice blog a week or two ago, we crunched the numbers on what the fiscal impact of of an influx in the fall of private school students returning to public schools. And we crunched the numbers for Michigan. If just 10% of private school students went back to public schools this fall, that's about $153 million in new expenses in the state of Michigan. If it's closer to 30%, we're talking about $459 million in new expenses. So you've got the problems that Ben highlighted where we're gonna see decreased revenue levels and potentially substantially increased costs. So I see a, a, a very real possibility of this kind of spiraling of you have more, more students than ever coming in, but less money to, to, 
to cope with them. And it's, I mean, I think you've got a really, really difficult situation that's happening there. Now, I can't, I constitutionally, I am unable to only tell bad news. So I do want to share another bit of, of, of better news and, and something that actually fascinated me. We just, we are doing a lot of polling uh, research on families um, and understanding how they're thinking about the coronavirus and the impact that it has on them. And one of the questions, we put a poll in the field earlier this month, we published it last week. We asked a question about homeschooling. And I don't know if you all have have had the same social media diet that, that I have, where it seems that this sort of um, accidental homeschooling that's happening right now has been just like a nightmarish scenario for everyone. You know, the, the tweets that the week into it said, you know, teachers should be making a billion dollars each. Um, got hundreds of thousands of likes and the people saying, can I call a substitute for my, you know, for my own teaching of my kids? People are loving those things. And so if that was the sort of funhouse mirror in which you viewed these things, you'd think, oh my goodness, like people are thinking this is a horrible experience. Well, wh when we actually asked a representative sample of Americans, what we found was that 28% of our survey respondents said that they viewed homeschooling much more favorably as a result of this experience and only 8% viewed it much less favorably. And when you include the sort of somewhat more, so 28% were much more favorable, 24% were somewhat more favorable, uh, and only 18% were somewhat less favorable. So the actual spread is that for the majority of people that responded to our survey, they have a more favorable view of homeschooling than they had before. And so I think that that if we talk about what, what maybe lasting changes might come out of that, that subtle shift that happened where there's a substantial portion of people that have sort of unwittingly or like um, without their consent have been sort of forced to homeschool. And it seems like some percentage of those people are actually really enjoying it and, and are seeing that as, as, a, um, as potentially a viable option for their kids. So if there is a silver lining to all of these gray clouds, it could be that there's families that are being exposed to a new way of educating their children that they otherwise wouldn't have um, and are actually enjoying it and may think about doing that in the future. Well, thank, thank you for at least that good news. Um, you know, I can speak to the fact my, my wife down here in Florida is a teacher for Florida Virtual School, and um, that has been one of the um, success stories, I think, in all of this is that for her, never skipped a beat and for her students they never skipped a beat and Florida being so well adv advanced on school choice and education options um, has really not su I don't think suffered as much I think there are obviously some instances where we are seeing some suffering but the growing pains haven't been as difficult because of the resources that are already in place and the choices that are already in place for uh, students how viable will online learning be now not just in Florida but around the country uh, where people, like you say, do start to realize that there are benefits to online uh, learning. You know, I think that, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about as a result of sort of all of this crisis, um, Nassim Taleb wrote that great book years ago called Anti-Fragile, about systems that are, that are, you have weak systems, you have fragile systems, you can have strong systems, but they can break. And the ultimate thing that we want to have is trying to create what we might call anti-fragile systems, that when they are, when shocks are given to them, they actually return stronger. So I think, I hope if we take lessons away from this whole experience, we start to think about ways to make our schooling system anti-fragile. That is to say, to be able to cope with difficult situations that just happen. You're down in Florida, hurricanes come through. You know, I'm in, I live in Tornado Alley. We have earthquakes and and with increased global interconnectedness like it was only a matter of time until something like a pandemic or disease like these things are just part of life that we have so we need to think about creating systems that can absorb shocks like this and so i think obviously online learning is some is a piece of that is having that if nothing else as a kind of backup system to say look you know we have snow days frequently here y'all y'all have snow days even more frequently up there um why can't we create some sort of system that can operate when it snows outside, right? Like, um, I think that, um, so we're not just talking natural disasters and those things, but creating, creating all of those types of issues. So I think that um, as with many of these things, I think people are going to be exposed to online learning that wouldn't have otherwise been exposed to it and are going to like it.
And I think there are people who are going to be exposed to online learning who otherwise wouldn't, who are not going to like it. So what I hope is that this will expose people to different ideas that are out there and it'll expand their sort of set of what are the potential schools that we could send our kids to. And then hopefully we have the policy responses to say, look, I don't think online learning is the right answer for many kids. There are many kids that will not thrive in an online learning environment and we shouldn't want to put them in one. Um, so the question is though, can this be one of those tools where we can help identify, better identify the school, the children that will be well served by this and help get them those resources and those opportunities? Can I jump in there for a second? Absolutely, Robert, go ahead. It's fun to see you. Um, I, I agree with, with what Mike is saying there, but, but I also wanna sound a, a cautionary note as well. I mean, you know, education technology, online learning, is kind of like the future of education and always will be. In other words, uh, you know, we, we have had a tendency in this work, all of us, uh, depending on what flavors we advocate for, to, to over-promise and, and, and under-deliver. Uh, so I like the paradigm of anti-fragility. That makes a great deal of sense. But look, let's, you know, the, uh, and I want to say this, my, 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 my choice bona fides are in good order, I think. I'm a staunch choice guy. But we also have to be really clear-eyed about the fact that we send our kids to school, not because it's the only thing we have and, it's, and we haven't come up with a better idea, but because it's a cultural value. We like these things called schools. In other words, when people complain, oh, school hasn't changed in generations, well, that's not a flaw, that's a feature. We, you know, we, we, we send our kids to places called schools every day because they confer certain things that we like. Um, it's not just the academics, it's their peers, it's the socialization, it's sports, it's arts, it's all these things. So, you know, let, let's just kind of tap the brakes a little bit on, on our kind of giddy over expectations that this changes everything. You know, I mean, if I, if I have to read one more piece about, oh, this is the new normal, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defenestrate. It's not, the old normal is still very much with us, and most of us can't wait to get back there. Key, Robert, is, is, as Mike talked about and you mentioned, is choice. Choice for families, choice for children, choice for local school districts to be able to choose what's best for each individual student and family. And that's the underlying word there that it keeps coming up in our discussion. And Robert, I do want to close with you quickly. Obviously, one of the things that's been most greatly impacted by this is the loss of standardized tests. We're not going to see really any standardized tests happen this year. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And what are your thoughts on essentially resetting education come the fall? You, you have to ask me a real simple question. Uh, Sorry about right. that. <laughs> it's okay. I've, I've, I've said for years I've got a very complicated relationship with, with standardized testing. You know, it's, it's kind of a moral imperative and, and for accountability purposes, it's not gonna go away. Um, but I've always been the guy who says, look, I can't turn a blind eye to the, the deleterious effects it has on, on, on curriculum, on teaching, on learning, on the act of schooling, and that doesn't change. So we're kind, of, we're kind of at an interesting pivot point. On the one hand, a year without standardized testing gives ammunition to anti-test advocates to say, hey, look, we're living without this just fine. On the other hand, and back to what I was saying before about the, the predictable learning losses, there's never gonna be a time where assessment, assessment to drive instruction, was more important than it's about to be, you know, 90, 120 days from now, whenever we get back to brick and mortar schooling or, or something closer to, to normal. So, so that, that, that conflict between the need for assessment to drive instruction while it's gonna be pilloried uh, as a, you know, for, for accountability purposes is, is gonna, that, that, that gulf is gonna be wider than ever. Thank you for that uh, for that answer. Um, I want to turn now to our some of the questions that we have in the in the chat box, um, and we'll try to go through these as quickly as possible. And if we don't get to your question, we have your name, and we'll be sure that someone gets back to you with an answer to your question. I want to start with a question from Edward, and I'll I'll direct this one to Mike. Um, the question is: How are you getting out the synchronous and asynchronous possibilities to the wider group of educators and administrators? Yeah, so I'm just writing about it. Uh, we push it out on our blog via all of our social media channels and everything. So um, 
I, look, I two things that folks would be very helpful if you want to take those blogs and share them with the people that you know, that would be great. I'm also always trying to look for new schools that are doing cool things. So if you happen to know of a school that's really coping well with this, um, my email is just mcshane at edchoice.org. So um, feel free to shoot those to me. If your kids or your grandkids or you teach in a school that is doing great, please let me know. But yeah, that's basically we're using the traditional means. We email them out to people. We're using social media and everything to get them in the bloodstream. Great, thank you, Mike. Next question from Bill uh, Rauerdink, um, who, and I'll direct this one to you, Ben. Um, we've obviously, a lot, many public uh, employees have not been laid off um, or fur furloughed during this during this crisis. Um, will anyone address what the legislature should do to eliminate um, non-classroom uh, administrators um, in Lansing, Michigan? A uh, great question. Um, a lot of the reason we have um, a, a majority of our employees in our K-12 system are non-teachers has to do with, with state and federal regulation. Um, I'd like to think that uh, not only doing things like focusing budget cuts on intermediate school districts where there are a lot of extra bureaucrats, um, but also creating more flexibility in the way we fund education and moving more decisions from the state to the local level uh, would lead to a greater reliance on um, uh, having teachers as opposed to non-teachers. There's always going to be, you know, support staff to some extent, but that should be minimized if we if we put that uh, focus on on the local and the more flexible approach. Great. Um, and then uh, from George, and I'll, I'll open this up to whoever wants to tackle this first. If there will be a shortage of K through 12 per student funding, um, any thought on taking away K th funding that is normally directed towards higher education? This is from George McMullen. Uh, I mean, I'll take a stab at that. I think uh, I think there's room in the, the state budget for those conversations, and we won't know until we see the revenue picture come out next month. Um, but uh, my default would be to say uh, fund it all according to student need um, as opposed to the way we fund higher education now in Michigan, which is a lot of legacy funding for larger universities. Uh, a lot of that can be done as well in taking advantage of this current moment. So I think I think all of that should be on the table for the legislature to look at. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, and, and you just answered our the final question I had essentially, which was about um, redirecting again about redirecting that funding that is normally allocated for um, higher education. Um, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us um, for this event. Uh, obviously, it is a wide ranging um, topic, um, has a, an incredible impact not just on obviously the kids and their learning but on um, state budgets, local budgets, federal budgets, um, and then obviously families. Um, so there's a lot of uh, consequences um, to the actions that have been taken at the federal and state levels. And uh, you know, we're not sure our legislators or our executives really thought through all of these, but uh, we'll have to, I guess, do a post-mortem on that after the fact. What I love about this topic is that it really, um, dovetails well with what we spoke about last week on labor policy. These are all connected issues. And, um, you know, we, flexibility was a term and choice were, was a, another word that were, was used earlier to discuss some of the things that uh, should be in place for these schools. Uh, Non-fragility, you know, those are all great terms. Well, a lot of what we're doing on labor reform is to try to undo some of that. And a lot of the uh, public sector unions, particularly the teachers unions, are the, the obstacles to that flexibility and that choice and that non-fragility. Um, and so our work on My Pay, My Say, Workers for Opportunity around the country is having a tremendous impact on this, not just today, but going forward in the future. And um, I think you're going to see some great results um, come out of this because there are going to be less obstacles to change and perhaps this will shed some even greater light on the importance of school choice, flexibility, and not being, having our education system being directed by uh, teachers unions, so uh, public sector teachers unions. So um, I really love that this topic built upon what we spoke about last week, 
Next week, we will be talking about another subject matter that I think builds upon um, the last three events we've hosted. Um, that will be an event instead of Tuesdays with Mackinac, it will be Monday with Mackinac, and we'll be discussing the book Crisis and Leviathan with Dr. Robert Waples. And that book, if you're not aware of it, is a great read. See if you can try and read it beforehand. Um, and we actually are going to be, uh, I think we'll be giving away um, some copies of the book to folks that join us next week. Um, but that is a book that talks about how uh, governments use crises to expand government authority. So um, no better time to discuss that than, than right now. But I want to thank Ben and Robert and Mike for all their great commentary. And if I can talk, turn quickly to Robert and Mike as to where they can find your work and where we can keep up with what you're doing uh, during this time. So Robert, quickly to you on where they can find your work. Sure, just Google the Fordham Institute or my name. Um, and I have my own personal blog is Robert Pandisio. Thanks for having me, Don. Thanks, Robert. Yes, you, can you? Find, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at MQ underscore McShane. Um, but then, yeah, checking out www.edchoice.org. You can basically find everything I'm up to there. Great. Thank you so much for your time, Mike. Uh, best to you and your families. And Ben, where can we find all the work that Mackinac does on education policy? Uh, Mackinac.org, M-A-C-K-I-N-A-C.org and slash education. We've got a lot of good resources there. Great. Thank you so much to all of you. Thanks to everyone who joined us. Um, we encourage you to, to continue to visit our events page to look for more events that we'll be bringing to you um, while you're all at home um, and um, probably we'll be bringing to you in the foresee for the foreseeable future. So uh, thank you for take spending your uh, Tuesday morning with us and uh, best wishes to you and all of your loved ones uh, during this time. Take care. <laughs>